Should we have a break? 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 Um, yeah. yeah, would that be better? No, I'm, I'm kind of out of here. I might enter my chair a little bit. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. We're not going up to the podium, right? No. Yeah. That's all right. Pretty good with your Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> what was that, Tracy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And Jan is going to be right around, and then Dr. Lee will be facing the first one. Okay. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Again, we're very thankful for the keynote speakers, uh, Jim Roberts, Commissioner Title, as well as Peter Rinspoon. Um, thank you very much for that dialogue and that information. We very, very much appreciate it. Uh, we're going to move right into the panel here, and I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Mary McNabb here, um, the co-founder of Canada's Community Care and Research Network, and uh, a, a badass in the scene, so I'm just going to throw that in there. Um, Dr. McNabb uh, holds over 15 years of global health field experience implementing and evaluating sexual reproductive health and rights and technology focused programs mainly in African countries, uh, Vietnam and Haiti. Most recently, Marion consulted with UNICEF New York to draft a global approach for digital health for over 130 countries and consulted with Health Enabled, a global digital health consulting firm, advised the Ugandan and South African Ministry of Health on the use of digital tools to eliminate mother to child transmission of HIV. Uh, Dr. Mary McNabb is also the CEO and co founder of the C3R, the Cannabis Community Care Research Network, a Massachusetts based cannabis research company aiming to improve evidence base related to medical cannabis therapies. C3R runs a virtual cannabis center of excellence, leveraging digital technologies to improve collaboration and research partnerships between academic, clinical, and cannabis communities. CPRN, along with UMass Dartmouth, is leading a two-year open cannabis consumer and patient research study to assess the impact on health, social, and economic outcomes. And in March 2019, CPRN, CPRN will launch an open cannabis veterans and veterans family member research study with partners of UMass Dartmouth and Veterans Alternative Healing. Uh, C3RN PHJBC will co-host an event series in 2019 focused on science, Education and breaking Canada's stigma, stigma in Massachusetts through community engagement. And CPRN is an approved qualified training vendor for the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission's social equity training program. So thank you, Marion. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Let's all give it a big round of applause. Very grateful to work with uh, with Anne this year and joint venture co on this event and launch of the series. And very grateful to our esteemed panel. Um, we're here and we're very grateful to have um, experts that start from pediatric to end of life care. And why we wanted to really focus on medical cannabis from all these different perspectives is just that underlying issue that Dr. Lester spoke about, Dr. Grayson spoke about in the video um, that cannabis uh, really maybe thinking about it as a health issue instead of focused on disease states. And so we're really trying to understand from these uh, esteemed experts, from their opinions, we've asked them to um, prepare you know, give some background about who they are and what their area of work is and to give us three areas of future advice and inquiry related to their expertise around medical cannabis. So I'll briefly introduce each of the panelists, then I'll ask each one um, to give some remarks. And we'll start from birth to end of life care. So we'll start with Dr. Eric Ruby. Um, we're very, very honored to have Dr. Ruby here today. Uh, he's one of two board certified pediatricians that recommend cannabis in Massachusetts. 
Dr. Ruby is a board certified pediatrician who has served patients in Taunton, Massachusetts in both private practice as well as a staff member at Morton Hospital for over 41 years. As a native of Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Ruby is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and received his medical training from SUNY Downstate Medical Center, where he graduated with honors in pediatrics. He completed his internship, residency, and fellowship at Oakland Children's Hospital in Northern California, receiving national board certification in 1975. Following his tenure with Children's Hospital, he served as a solo pediatrician at George Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert. In 1977, Dr. Ruby began his own practice and quickly immersed himself in the life surrounding community. Over the years, his volunteer services included Head Start, Taunton Boys and Girls Club, Camp Dandy for Girls, um, among others. A defining event in Dr. Ruby's life was a spinal cord injury suffered by his son, Ethan, in 2000, while he was struck in the middle of New York City crosswalk by an automobile. Dr. Ruby founded Massachusetts Walks Again in 2003, which has raised over $2 million to fund research and improve the quality of life for those with spinal cord injury. Thank you, Dr. Ruby. His son's experience as a Colorado resident with the efficacy of medical cannabis for relief of his post-injury pain led, Dr. led to Dr. Ruby's involvement with this alternative medication. Dr. Ruby is a member of the Association of Cannabis Specialists. His professional, uh, Dr. Ruby served as the Chief of Pediatrics at Morton Hospital from 1981 to 83, 87 to 89, 93 to 95, 2005 to 2009. And his professional associations uh, include president of the Bristol North Chapter of the Massachusetts Medical Society, member of the House of Delegates and the Legislative Committee. He's a member of the Massachusetts Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and is a member of the National Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. In 2007, Dr. Ruby was rightly selected as the MMS Community Physician of the Year, and he is a member of the American Medical Association. So thank you very much, Dr. Ruby. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for that introduction because I didn't want to say all those things myself. <laughs> <laughs> but suffice to say that um, I'm a clinician, so I deal with people. And a long time ago, somebody says, Oh, Dr. Ruby, I've known you now for a couple of years. You're a gem of a doctor. So that's um, tooting my own horn there. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Beth, uh, Marion, and Ann, and uh, C3, for inviting me. Uh, I just listened to the Oscars, so I'm not going to thank everybody else. <laughs> That's enough. I see light back in her face. She smiles more. I'm going to start my, um, because you told me I have seven minutes. <laughs> I see light back in her face, she smiles more, she is interested in things that are mentioned and places that she may go. She is not depressed anymore, I don't find her crying in her room anymore. That was one thing that broke my heart when I saw her in pain, I always knew she wasn't well and when she was having bad days. I would sense it and I would text her or knock on her door and I would find her crying, but she hasn't been going through that anymore since mid-December. Her dad and I are so grateful that this medication has helped her so much. She is so responsible with her doses. I honestly say now that this form of medication is the right one for her. That's what I'm hearing. And that's what you need to know. Cannabis saved my son's life. On November 29, 2000, uh, Ethan, who was then 25 years old, was hit by a car um, in New York City. He was paralyzed. He was, he's now a T6 complete. His central neuropathic pain was treated by well-meaning physicians with opioids. He became addicted, and within one year, he decided that he was going to kill himself. Luckily, he was with a friend of his who was using cannabis uh, for Crohn's disease. And by the way, that particular gentleman now uh, is free of Crohn's disease and was told by his GI specialist he's never seen anyone ever become free of Crohn's disease without medication for Crohn's disease. So when Ethan said he was 
free of pain because of cannabis, he said, Dad, um, this is the answer. I said, well, you cannot use it here in Massachusetts. The um, prisons are not wheelchair friendly and uh, I will get in a lot of trouble. You're gonna have to move to Colorado. So a couple weeks later, he told his mother and me that he was moving to Colorado, at which point she almost killed me. Because <laughs> you don't send a 26 year old out to Colorado who knows nothing about Colorado, is in a wheelchair, doesn't know where he's gonna live and doesn't know what he's gonna do. Well, he started a grow facility and it took him three years to get that grow facility the way he wanted it, um, and to find out that CBD was what he needed, full spectrum CBD. He moved back to Connecticut, where he was the founder of Theraplant, which was the first licensed grow facility in Connecticut. Um, he has a family, a wife, two children, drives a Mercedes, and has a nicer car than I have. <laughs> I have to put this down now, so. This is the Constitution of the United States. It is 22 pages long. This is the regulation. <laughs> 105 CMR 725. It is 52 pages long. Guidance for healthcare providers regarding the medicinal use of marijuana. 10 pages long. Medical use of marijuana online system, 17 pages long. Ability for a child to be able to get medicinal cannabis, 27 pages long. When I give this to the patient, I say photocopy it and send it in, certified mail, return receipt request. They lose it. I am very concerned that when they said the medicinal marijuana program was going to be turned over to the Cannabis Commission and they're going to keep the same people, I said, oh my God, we need a change. We need a very big change. Thank goodness I went to a symposium that Nicole Snow put together on Massachusetts patient advocacy. 2019, year of the medicinal marijuana patient. I listened to Britt McBride, and she said she had three major components. Listen to the patient advocacy, expand research, and anticipate federal regulations. Britt McBride and Jennifer Flanagan, two people on the commission, spent three hours in my office on Wednesday. They took down a lot of notes. Actually, as I was talking, I could see her changing and Xing out things. We need to have things streamlined. I said, okay, let me talk to your points. Listen to patient advocacy. Change the attitude. Have faith in your job and respect of your job. And the people who work for your commission need to have respect for the patient. If you call a telephone number and it never picks up, you get discouraged. If it finally picks up after 25 minutes and somebody says, I can't help you, that's no good. If somebody says, I'll get back to you and never gets back to you, that's no good. You have to be responsive. If, if I didn't do this for my patients and call everybody back by the end of the day, I couldn't live with myself. Everybody in my office, in my practice gets a call. It might be 10 o'clock at night, but they're gonna get a call. So attitude is number one with communication. If there's a problem with filling out the form, get back to that patient and say it. Don't send it to them. Um, don't, don't send it to them two weeks later. Send it to them right now. Be competent. Don't tell them, call your doctor, he's the one who's got to figure this out. No, they are supposed to figure it out. And 
$50 and, and a waiver, they shouldn't have to pay a dime more. They're disabled. Respect the fact that people are calling you because they want help. Make, listen to patient advocacy. Expand research. We've got to go from schedule one to schedule two or be our own schedule. If the federal government doesn't do this, um, they, they just, they're being controlled by money. Money from alcohol, from tobacco, and from pharmaceutical industry. This is ridiculous. And <laughs> so if we want to be a model system for country, I am very concerned about the dispensaries. We need to make sure that every bottle of concentrate or every uh, leaf or whatever, whatever they get, capsules, says what they're getting. Uh, you know, cannabis, and I'm glad we're talking cannabis and not marijuana. Marijuana is an xenophobic situation. It's talking about Mexican drug lords. It's talking about um, something that, that William Randolph first said, if you let a black man get marijuana, he'll rape your white daughter. I'd put him in jail right now. This is not reefer madness. This is a medication. And I like the fact that I heard that it's not only for disease, but it's also for health. And we were just talking about I take a vitamin every day. Maybe I should start taking CBD every day, too. Anyway, every, any, any medication that goes out of a pharmacy, it says what you're taking. It says 250 milligrams per capsule. It says 160 milligrams per five mLs. If the bottle leaves that pharmacy without that information, I don't want to know what the total amount is. I want to know what the percentages are, yes, but I want to know dosing. And if you can't standardize it and you can't measure it, you can't get data and you can't do research. So if this is not standardized and if this is not put out there like a true trial, you'll never get the doctors to go with it. We're talking science. Doctors do science. I do science, but I also do art. And the art is you've got to deal with the patient. So um, compassion. Expand the research, schedule one to schedule two, and measure it, and don't let it out of the farm. You know, in Colorado, you can't work in a dispensary unless you're a pharmacist. I don't want people selling to my patients, this is on sale, why don't you get some? That's not it. I want the, the CBD, the THC, what are the turbinoids, and what are you getting? Because they can't call me back and say, I'm taking cannabis or I'm taking marijuana. I don't know what they're taking, and they don't know what they're taking. So know what you're doing. Anticipate federal regulations, legalize it, legalize, don't penalize. Um, we were talking earlier. <clears throat> Prohibition is what is making this so popular. Mark Twain said it. You want to make something popular, make it illegal. If we make it legal, we'll do a whole lot better. So my art of this is attitude, research, taxes, A-R-T. Big messages. Get the date straight on the certificate. You know, they, they come to see me, they have seen me on a special date, and by the way, it says month, day, year in one place, and then day, month, year in another place. How much can you try to confuse people? Get it right. You put it on an Excel, Excel spreadsheet for me, why is one of my patients listed three different places? Once is enough. Get that right, too. Um, number two, uh, again, at the dispensary level, got to be milligrams per ml, milligrams per drop, what's in a vape. They only need to take two vapes, but what are they getting? CBD and THC at school. The nurses won't give CBD, and they certainly won't give THC CBD. But uh, this is against uh, 1990 uh, Americans with Disability Act. I have encouraged people to sue the school because 
a doctor is making a recommendation. And what is the problem here? Another one, you don't need two doctors to do this. One is enough. And I skipped by something that is pretty important. It comes out of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it does say that if a child has a problem that other medications have not helped, or this child is dying, it is appropriate for the pediatrician to okay cannabis. It doesn't say he needs a specialist. It just says he can do it. And that's really what ought to be. So I'm way over. I will just read one more. Dear Dr. Ruby, we cannot thank you enough for how much you have helped our son and us as a family. We continue to see big improvements. This is about an autistic child. And a new world for him every day. We look forward to updating you at our next follow-up. He can finally enjoy the sunshine outside without needing a hat or sunglasses. Thank you. Very powerful. Thank you for your work and leadership. Pediatrics is a very contentious area, and I think one that is extremely important. Um, so we'll move along to Jan. We've already heard her background. Um, oh boy, just so we'll move on to you and see what your three uh, takeaways should be. Well, I wish I could say that I had three. I'm trying to still whittle them down to three. Um, but first, I, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Ruby for what he's saying about um, as a mental health provider, I have seen what cannabis can do. I work with autistic patients. I work with uh, patients with eating disorders, PTSD. And when you see what happens with your patients, it, I, I feel like it's very um, unethical to provide them the care that they need. And one of the things um, I'm really concerned about that I see are some large healthcare institutions, I don't know if Massachusetts has this much, but a lot of physicians are being told that they cannot prescribe, they cannot write for applications. And even physicians who agree with it are being told by other health, their healthcare organizations that they're not allowed to prescribe this, and, and that or to recommend it. And that is very concerning to me. I've had patients with cancer who went to probably the top three oncologists in the U.S. I, there are two patients that come to my mind. They both had stage, um, they, they were basically terminal, and uh, two different types of cancer. So one went to the best oncologist in the U.S. who told the patient that he was not allowed to recommend this because the institution where he worked wouldn't allow that. And, it, and the other patient went to their local oncologist, you know, wasn't on USA News and World Report, but they were easily able to recommend it. And, and I think that's a huge patient issue. Another thing for me is we absolutely, and I mentioned it earlier, have to discuss um, and have to really know exactly what is in the cannabis that, that's being used. We need to know the terpenoid content. We need to know the cannabinoids. We even need to be able to study them because I feel like the research that's out there is incredibly incomplete because we don't know what the profiles are. And so our patients don't know. I know um, education is huge as well. But one thing I think, I, I try to philosophize a lot, unfortunately I'm not a philosopher, but the mind and the body are the same. We talk about psychosomatic symptoms, we talk about pain. Well, you can't look at one without the other. They both influence each other. And we need to be able to realize that cannabis is a gateway to well-being. Cannabis is a gateway to healthy functioning. If you know the science behind the endocannabinoid system, you know that this is really about achieving the optimal state of being, homeostasis. And, and we keep forgetting about that. And, and I love that you, you, know, you had mentioned this, that this is about health. It's not necessarily about sickness. And we need to be able to, to say that. Um, also, I would like to see more of us who are users to come out. Because frankly, I think until we start to dispel the myths about 
the lazy pothead, you know, until we're, we're brave enough to say, this is who I am and I'm fine the way I am and I'm doing well, you know, that we're always going to have the stigma. And so for me, you know, we've had this conversation about whether or not we should show this on the podcast or not because we have a video thing to it. And, and, and I hate that conversation because I am, I don't consider, I consider mine therapeutic use. And uh, my use is not abuse. And we have to quit thinking that use equals abuse. And especially in my field, it's, it's maddening. I'm totally going more than three. And then the other thing is that we need to have more inclusion. We know that in any kind of research that you cannot, you know, most research used to be based on white males. And we need to be able to have inclusion of minorities, females, and different experiences come to the table because we actually grow from that. We have an opportunity in this field to make a huge cultural change, huge, if we hold to these ideals that this plant, I think, can pro promise us. You know, all of us are very different. We all have unique experiences, but we're all here for the same reason, for the, to, to learn about this, the substance, or the substances. And, and I think that we have an opportunity to make sure that this isn't about big pharma, that this isn't about um, big tobacco or even alcohol getting into it, because this is what's happening. And we need to be able to be vocal about that and to be part of the solution. Um, <coughs> I, and again, I, I said this earlier, and we had this debate last week with another person that I want. I don't like adult use, really don't like recreational use. It's therapeutic use. And we need to be able to recognize that, that people are using this for reasons, very important reasons. We see, um, uh, you know, I, I gave you an example of my anorexic patient uh, who went to the dispensary. And as a treating clinician, and if you've ever dealt with an eating disorder, you know that even if people gain weight, they're never psychologically okay with themselves. I have seen this drug actually make people accept their bodies, who've had years of body dysmorphia and who've been able to find some acceptance that they never could have. As a clinician, that is so powerful to me. I've had a patient um, who had flashbacks all the time. And this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. He um, is able, he doesn't have the flashbacks that he used to have. We found him a variety that was incredibly um, healthy for him and helped him feel vital again. He had, his uh, wife had committed suicide and he had found her. He was really struggling. I was afraid he was suicidal. He was suicidal for a while and this, medication has helped him live the life that he used to have. And, and we know that mice without CB receptors, um, actually they keep having these constant thoughts. And so by having these receptors in our brain, they're able to, when they're having a healthy endocannabinoid system, whether or not they're supplementing it with phytocannabinoids or if it's just healthy regardless, it actually helps them not to have these flashbacks, not to have these memories. They're able to forget. And when you start to see this, and I think all of us have seen this with our patients, that it, it's incredibly powerful and you can't argue with that. Um, but I, I, I really want to look at also the ECS and move regulation. That's my near and dear to my heart thing and seeing how we can really impact mood functioning by a healthy in the cannabinoid system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your work and leadership and research in this area. I'm really looking forward to um, reading more studies that come out. If I ever edit that journal. And we all know Dr. Curtis Spoon, so we'll repeat his biography as well. Um, but what are your three major takeaways? Okay, well, first of all, Marion said we were going to span the life, uh, span the um, spectrum from pediatrics to end-of-life care, and she looked this way. I'm hoping with end-of-life care, she's talking about Dr. Zaiklin, because I'm a primary care doctor, and I try to keep people alive, not kill them. So hopefully you're talking about him, not me. Um, I certify medical cannabis patients as part of my primary care um, uh, practice. I'm trying to integrate it into primary care, which ideally, I think that's how it should be, just like any other medical uh, treatment. 
Um, I'm one of two physicians at MGH that do that. Um, I've been doing it for about two years. About six months ago, they said that we're allowed to do it. So um, it's interesting um, what Jan says about uh, doctors saying they're not allowed to do it. Um, they both are and aren't allowed to do it, depending on which of the many. We have about you know 20 people that regulate us, and according to the federal um, institutions that regulate us, we're not allowed to do it. And according to the state people that regulate us, we are allowed to do it. And I think it's sort of uh, intelligence test for hospitals how they deal with the medical cannabis issue because patients are all asking for it, like everybody's asking for it. And the hospitals could either say, we just don't deal with this and our doctors don't prescribe it, uh, certify it, or they could try to figure out a way how to accommodate patients. And I'm really glad to say, um, and it might be just because I've been like uh, bugging the crap out of them, but my hospital is being pretty uh, intelligent about this and they're actually trying to come up with a way to uh, uh, accommodate uh, patients. Now, the problem is you're not allowed to bring cannabis into any hospital because it gets federal funds and it's illegal and they have to confiscate it and um, otherwise they will lose all their federal funding. It's not their fault. They don't want to confiscate it. Most of the people there aren't against cannabis, but that's just the way it is. And they're worried that if their outpatient doctors recommend medical cannabis, then that creates the expectation if you use it as an outpatient that you could use it as an inpatient. If I start you on a blood pressure medication as an outpatient, of course you could use it as an inpatient. So there's no other medication with that uh, situation where you can use it as an outpatient, but you can't use it as an inpatient. So we're having meetings and they're really trying to finesse this and figure out how it works. Um, but I'm really glad that my hospital is trying to figure this out. Whereas I read recently the Cleveland Clinic just said, we don't, none of our doctors, none of our practitioners, and we just as an institution don't um, believe in or prescribe medical cannabis. And I'm like, you guys are brain dead. Th that was my exact uh, diagnosis on Twitter, that this institution <laughs> is completely brain damaged because you just can't do that across the board for a million reasons. I mean, patients are using it. What are they gonna do, lie to their doctors? And then what are the doctors gonna do? just pretend that their patients aren't using it. It's just awful care. It undermines the doctor-patient relationship. It, it's just ridiculous on a, a bunch of levels. And it, it goes back um, to what I said before too about doctors have to get on board and they have to become educated. Um, you have these addiction psychiatrists that, that go to their patients and they say, you don't use marijuana, do you? And the patient says, no, of course not doctor. And then, you know, that can be one way of taking care of patients, but then you don't know what your patient's doing. They don't tell you and they go to less, um, reliable sources of information. So one of my big um, sort of uh, things that I say on my high horse is that doctors, whether they're pro, anti, or neutral about cannabis, need to be educated enough to have an intelligent discussion and dispassionate discussion with their patients. That's like the bare minimum. So anyways, um, I um, just wanted to talk briefly about one of my patients, just because uh, it's relevant to the, the group that um, Steve and Randy and Marion are, are working on is a patient with PTSD. He couldn't uh, get the time of day um, from the VA. Uh, he was using eight shots of vodka a day for his PTSD and was very miserable. And then he, um, we worked to switch him over to medical cannabis. And now he literally takes one or two sips from his vaporizer a day. And his PTSD is like completely controlled. He goes out of his house. Whenever he starts to feel out of control, he takes a, a puff and um, he's just flourishing. It's just really amazing. Uh, the good news is that he's doing like phenomenally well, like his like reborn, like he's like 60 years old. He's a, a veteran from the Vietnam War. The bad news is that he had to leave the VA for his health care and come to our health center. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I just um, I'm really eager for veterans to get much more open access to this. Um, the areas where I'd like to see um, uh, research progress and improvement, as, as you probably can tell, I'm, I'm pretty eager for physicians to get more up to speed on this issue and to be less judgmental and less sort of, you know, a program to be against it and to at least have an open mind about it, if not be, um, you know, on board with using it for health and wellness. Um, and then there are certain clinical conditions that I think are urgent that we get more research on, particularly the opiate crisis. I mean, more people are dying every year from opiates than ki were killed in the entire Vietnam War. Uh, about 70,000 people a year are dying of the opiate crisis and 40,000, 49,000 people died the entire Vietnam War. I mean, this is crazy and cannabis is such an off, obvious gateway out of the opiate crisis. And then as Jan mentioned, benzos are out of control too. Most people overdose don't overdose just on fentanyl. It's always fentanyl and gabapentin and a bunch of other things, including benzos. And um, people do prescribe too many benzos, uh, meaning as you mentioned, diazepam, 
uh, Valium, Clonopin, Xanax. And it's because people are stressed out. We have an anxiety epidemic, which mirrors our epidemic in opiates and in benzodiazepines. And, you know, it's really hard to treat people with anxiety. And if they're having panic attacks, it's really easy to prescribe them something. And um, cannabis is so much safer an alternative. Um, so I think that's, as Marion's research showed, that's like what a third of people use cannabis for. But I think that physicians, especially the addiction psychiatrists, shouldn't be treating these people like they're using something harmful. They should be recognizing that they're using something that's helping them. So um, the two things that I mentioned are related, the need to use, research it more for mental health um, and addiction uh, purposes and uh, the stigma that doctors still cling on to with their drug war mentality. Um, and then the final thing I'm going to say is we do need more research specifically with these mental health uses, uh, autism and anxiety in particular. Um, at one of the meetings at, at my hospital, the head of pediatric um, addiction services said there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that cannabis is effective for any mental health condition. Boom. End of discussion. And then he's like, the dispensaries won't work with me uh, to do research. I'm like, of course not, because you're against it and you're going to any research you do a priori will be against it. And he got a little bit offended. But, you know, we had a good talk. Um, but the fact is, I mean, it was I, I mean, the fact is, um, you know, we do need good research. And the point he the thing he was arguing, uh, he's really smart. The point he was arguing is that a lot of these young people use cannabis for their anxiety and just like people with opiates and chronic pain, it's hard to tell if the opiates are treating the chronic pain or if they're just physically dependent and then you take away their opiates and they feel awful because you take away their opiates and the opiates aren't really doing anything for their chronic pain because there's not really good data that opiates even help with chronic pain. Just once people get on them, they feel awful if you take them off. And with cannabis and anxiety in young people, for I think it really helps people, but he was making the argument that it might be the case that they just get anxious when they're not on it and he was looking at it like they have cannabis use disorder. And I'm looking at it like they're treating their anxiety appropriately. And it's just amazing that there are two completely different narratives in the same medical world. And I just think research could help narrow that gap. I mean, I think the truth is probably some people do one, some people do other. But the fact that we have such divergent theories and we all have the same goal of helping people uh, really help if we had some good research so that we're not just arguing about it in a research-free zone. And then the final thing would be great if we did more research on diabetes and THCV um, and different cannabinoids. That one in particular, diabetes is so epidemic. Um, I can't wait for more of that research to come out. Anyways, that's it. And next up, we have Dr. Ryan Zacklin. Uh, Dr. Ryan Zacklin is a trained internal medicine, uh, geriatric medicine, integrative medicine, mind body medicine, and cannabinoid medicine specialist. It's a mouthful. It's a lot of specialties. He earned his Doctor of Medicine from the University of Virginia and completed his training in internal medicine at Mass General Hospital. After serving on faculty at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Zacklin continued working for partners within the Spalding Rehab Network. In addition to his current partner's position working in skilled nursing facilities, he maintains uh, he also maintains a private practice in integrative medicine and care, cannabis therapeutics. Within his practice, Dr. Zacklin works together with his patients, partnering his foundation in internal medicine with mind-body medicine, yoga, energy medicine, herbal medicine, cannabis, therapeutics, nutritional and functional medicine to help them return to their natural state of balance. He views optimization of the endocannabinoid system via plant medicine and other integrative disciplines as an essential to achieving this goal. Being an accomplished musician, he has a particular interest in the link between ECS and music. So thank you, Dr. Zappa, for being here. Thank you. <coughs> so, thank you, uh, CPRN, Marion, and Randy, uh, professional badasses. Uh, they really <laughs> from now. There's alternative healing, joint ventures for this gracious invitation. Um, and to all um, involved, I guess I'm, I'm anxious to hear about this, um, the announcement that's that's coming. So um, you kind of already told, talked about who I am. I'm a conventionally trained physician um, and um, yeah, I, you know, I trained at MGH. I kind of was on an unofficial mind-body medicine track with the Benson Henry Institute. And, and much of my integrative training has happened um, during all of my free time in my adult life. Um, and I look at integrative medicine as a, as a comprehensive, holistic partnership 
uh, where I use both conventional and unconventional, often natural modalities to help patients elicit their own innate ability to heal. Um, and as Mary mentioned, I help people come back into balance. And I feel fortunate to be practicing during an era in which the endocannabinoid system, our own physiological system that helps us maintain balance or homeostasis has now come to light. And I think it's important, and I really appreciate Jan mentioning several times, you know, this is really not about cannabis. It's really about our own physiology and the ECS. And cannabis happens to be the most efficient way to optimize it, um, I guess, therapeutically, although perhaps deep breathing and a quick meditation is the most efficient way. Um, but it's really about the ECS. And I've been working, I've been fortunate to have trained in, with partners and I've been working with them for over a decade. I have my private practice. Um, but I also work in skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes. I take care of both short-term and long-term care patients. And I've been working with this population now for about seven years, and I've done some um, kind of um, continuing medical education, geriatric training, but I'm really kind of a grandfather, that's funny, I'm a grandfather geriatrician, right? Um, kind of grandfathered in. But what's interesting is that the, the geriatric credo, which is start low and go slow, is also the cannabis therapeutics credo. And it goes quite well with my affinity for natural modalities because I'm really, I'm actually quite conservative when it comes to medications and I'm a minimalist. And so using cannabis therapeutics medically right, medicinally, is completely different than therapeutic use. There's an overlap, but most of my patients that come to me, um, their referral is through the partner's network. They're cannabis naive. They're not familiar with the cannabis culture. They're not already using cannabis. And so this is, I mean, my youngest patient is 18. My oldest is 96. And so um, I think it's really important to make that distinction because that's part of the issue is that the medical cannabis model has blossomed really from the, um, the cultural therapeutic or recreation. I like to think of it as recreation, right? So recreation, we're recreating ourselves in a way. We're stepping back and allowing ourselves to kind of take a minute to recreate who we are. But that's part of the issue is that the, the, the model has kind of stemmed from that. And I think we need to, as Dr. Ruby has, um, has, has so eloquently stated in so many ways, we need to kind of cut it off and, and, and revamp the system from a medical perspective and make it look more like a medical system than within which we practice. So one of the first barriers that I, that I know within skilled nursing facilities and hospice programs is that they're federally funded, right? It comes down to this federal misschedule, right? Because at this point, um, I mean, to be frank, right, it's horseshit. It is medicine. There's no debate. It's a fact. I put up a slide when I'm giving a talk, and it's a photo of the, of the earth in front of the sun, and I say, before I go on to discuss cannabis as medicine, we have to be on the same page. The object in the front is round, and it is revolving around the object in the back, correct? Because if you think that it's flat or that it's the latter, then, you know, then we're not on the same page here. And so... I really think that that's the biggest barrier because, you know, I mean, you can only kind of, you know, uh, you got to, there's so much work to be done. So for me, I'm going to kind of go where it's a little bit easier to get things done and make headway, right? And this is why we're all here. But these skilled nursing facilities, they won't touch it. They're not going to, they're not going to threaten their funding. And hospice, to be frank, which I'm sure Tracy will tell us about, it's frustrating. I mean, I, it's, I'm biting my th it's a joke. Every single hospice patient should be on cannabis. End of story. There's no question. But yet, how many hospice referrals have I gotten? Zero. Zero. So it's, you know, it, to me, that's a real big part of the problem is this, is just the fact that these, you know, I mean, and, and, and I think Peter had mentioned too, right? I mean, one of the concerns is long-term effects. It's a perfect population. We don't have to worry about it long-term effects and i really love how you eloquently stated that these people can really enjoy these last few 
days, weeks, months that they have with their families and actually maybe benefit from some of the um, more uh, mind expanding aspects that cannabis offers in which they might actually deepen their connection and their understanding of who they are on their journey as they exit their body to whatever it lies next for them. Right, so I really think that that's, it's, it's so essential that this happens. But for me, I've kind of decided, you know, I'm not gonna keep knocking on the hospital's door until the new uh, administration changes over or whatnot. There's so much more work to be done. So the second piece is I think the entire certification slash registration system really needs revamping. I tell my patients the certification is superfluous to our relationship. Right, I mean, I, I used to say a monkey could certify, but I'll say a computer could certify. I mean, really, right, these patients had an ICD-10 code from their physician, from any physician. So if that physician has billed for that code, it's, I mean, we live in a technological age, it can just register with the state and they can therefore be eligible for this medicine just as they're eligible for every other medicine out there. It makes no sense to me as a system, but again, it's, I mean, and so now let's even look at some of the details. It's geared for a, a highly computer literate population. All right, stating that a paper application is available is a weak compensation. There has to be a middle ground because uploading a non-glaring photo of one's license in an appropriate sized JPEG format to wait for two weeks while you're suffering to finally find out that it didn't go through and you have to resubmit it is an atrocity. I mean, you know, my patients, my 85 year old with Parkinson's can send an email and can do online banking. I can, my staff can barely register them. You know, we have a service that we offer, they pay for it, but we assist them with registration. So I think that, um, I mean, that's a huge, uh, huge barrier. And not to mention too, when I, I, I started going to assisted living facilities, okay? So what do you need in order to get your CC, now CCC card? You need a valid Massachusetts driver's license, passport, or ID. Who the heck has a Massachusetts ID? That's not a, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I don't mean to make a comment because there probably is some population that I'm maybe not considering who would have it and need it, but most people have a driver's license if they drive. If you are now needing to live in an assisted living facility, most likely you don't have a valid driver's license. You may not be traveling the world much, so you may not need a valid passport. So let's say you do have a passport. Well, now you need a utility bill. You need all of these other bills. Now that if you're an assisted living facility, you don't get those articles, right? So it's it's just, that's a huge barrier to entry. So it's like the skilled nursing facilities, hospice won't touch it. What about the assisted living facilities? Well, they need licenses and then all this. It was just, for me, it got to be too much. And I said, you know what? Uh, let's focus on the best for now. I mean, I'm willing to focus on all of them, but you know, at least we can make some headway. So now the last one is also important. We've all talked about this. So consistent products is so essential, right? I, I make recommendations to my patients. I mean, I think frankly to do up to not is unethical. I, I mean, I, I, if you're, if you're recommend, I, I can't prescribe it, but I'm recommending a medicine and to just, you know, recommend that the bud tender that just, you know, lost their job at EMS is going to make a recommendation on how to manage their complex Parkinson's or migraines or PTSD or anxiety or whatever it is, uh, is, is, I mean, it's just unethical. Um, and so what I tell my patients is I'm going to, you know, this is your first fish and I make a specific recommendation, but then I also teach them how to fish and I teach them about the ECS and how to come up with their ratio of CBD to THC and what dose they need and what terpenes, if that's necessary and whatnot, and what it means, some of the terminology. But what happens to some of my patients, it's analogous to me prescribing an antibiotic Okay, and they go to CVS and they either say, no, I'm sorry, we don't have that. No, they don't have it anyway in CVS. You know, we're out of it. But, and the kid behind the register says, oh, Cipro? Well, how about Bactrim? It's just as good. I'm sorry. Right? And so how is that for my therapeutic relationship with my patient who I just 
spent all my time and energy convincing this 80-year-old gentleman that it's okay to use cannabis, right, and made a very specific recommendation, and now they can only go to the one spot that has it, and they can no longer have it, so who's going to tell them what to get? That's not an acceptable model for medical care. So, and the model is mostly flower-based and inhaled medicine-based as well. I think this stems from initial seed blossoming into a high THC black market due to the illicit nature, and it really needs to be weeded out, right? I don't condone smoking to my patients ever, and I rarely recommend vaping. The cartridges um, are a potential bridge to therapy, but due to heavy metal toxins and heavy metals that are found in them, they're concerning to me. We're, we're adding back terpenes based off of what clinical data? Okay, ter terpenes have toxic metabolites when vaporized, so I'm not comfortable necessarily recommending um, highly processed products. Ideally, a live rosin and a high quality cartridge is, would be the only thing I'm really comfortable at this time, and possibly vaping whole flour. But, you know, the average 77 year old is not grinding up their granddaddy purple, loading up their packs, <laughs> hitting the right setting, and then it's gummed up. Oh, let me get my rubbing alcohol and dip it in and clean the thing out and rub up. You know, it's like, it's just not a good model. So until we have an FDA approved medical grade whole flour vaping device with consistent dosing available everywhere, I'm steering away from inhaled medicine and flour. So we need high quality, organic THCA. Nobody's talked about that yet today. We need THCA available everywhere. It's available, thank you, Netta, for the one place in Massachusetts that has it. Uh, Healthy Farms had the one-to-one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one -to -one -to -one for five seconds, and that's gone. We need THCA, indica sativa, and CBD tinctures with consistent concentration for dose titration. Dose titration and low dose, one, two, five milligram gummies and capsules available in every dispensary in the state. It has to be available everywhere. Not wax and shatter and peanut butter and pizzas and all these things that are fun for our therapeutic events that we're having, right? It's not medicine. So, I mean, I can't condone, you know, again, for reasons I just mentioned, the concentrates, I can't condone them, condone them at all. But the other is fine. I'm not saying anything against it. Sure. I mean, I think there is high risk of increase, you know, 11-hydroxy uh, THC and, and the risk of psychosis with these high-dose edibles and whatnot. So I, I don't think it needs, it should be willy-nilly. Um, but I'm not telling my patients to go get a pizza and eat a quarter of it, you know, in the morning and another quarter, whatever. I mean, that's, I don't even know if they're still making that. And then the other thing is that the, um, the medical cards need to, the reciprocity, have, the reciprocity has to happen uh, on a nationwide scale because to, for somebody to be dependent on a medicine and have to fly anywhere with it, I mean, out of the country, sure, I understand it, but not have their medicine is really, um, is, is terrible. So what would help these barriers, right? Federal rescheduling. Um, I think we have plenty to do on a, on a state level. I think um, we had just mentioned, you know, one quick thing, I mean, an easy, one easy fix for um, barriers to entry is you need an exam, right? Well, this is not a medicine and we're not prescribing it. So why do you need an actual physical exam? You just need a bona fide relationship with the patient. I mean, we can perform mental health via telemedicine. So why can't we do it like a state like New York or California where telehealth is acceptable? I think that's one step. But really, I think most importantly is that our fellow physicians need to stop with the nonsense. Okay, it is medicine. Stop considering therapeutic, adult, recreational. The data based on high dose smoking is not going to apply to starting low, going slow with literal drops of a tincture at micro dosing. So I think that needs to change. And I'm sure I went over, but thank you very much. <laughs> The last speaker, thank you so much, Tracy. And last but not least, uh, Tracy Gregory is the Quality Assurance Staff Development Nurse at the Hospice of Western and Central Mass and loves helping people learn, excel, and have a little fun while doing both. She graduated from Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts with a uh, Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology and a minor in Philosophy and has spent the majority of her career in the healthcare industry 
uh, gaining experiences in areas of pediatrics, psych psychiatry, intensive care, education, medical and surgical work, long-term care, and hospice. She's the point person uh, for the agency's We Honor Veterans program and is an advocate for patients access to medical cannabis. So thank you, Tracy, yeah. for being here. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm writing my notes and the things I'm going to say, like the more everybody talks, I'm like, nope, you already said that. Uh, <laughs> so I can easily keep this in my seven minutes now. Um, <laughs> so you already have sort of my background. So the last five years I've been in hospital. Um, so I've been a nurse for over 23 years now, and it really wasn't until like three years ago that I never heard of an endocannabinoid system, but even what it was. Um, I have several chronic pain conditions that I have managed with more than double medications. Um, I try to get my meds in a little pill box and it would go in. So I decided to see what this is about. I got my card, and honestly, within like six months of starting to do this, I went from a four opioid a day habit to maybe a four opioid a year. It's really bad. So I could see it. And I wanted other people to see what it was too. Um, so I started integrating it into our orientation programs. Every single one of our staff members was educated about it. Um, and then the more people received the education and the more we had um, patients and families that wanted to know more about it, it just sort of like, it sort of grew and grew and grew. So now it's not just a matter of like the academics of it, it's just actually like seeing it happen. Um, so because all of you will be able to speak different things, I'm going to speak sort of specifically to um, veteran PTSD at end of life. Um, as you mentioned, we are a veteran program, and it's actually a national program that hospices and some of the business system partner with, and there is, well, there's four stars, now there's going to be five stars at the level, and at each level, you have to obtain different things. So the basic level is for um, every patient, they get a go to history assessment. So we don't want to just know, are you a veteran? We want to know, where did you serve? What war did you serve? What did you do? Did you see combat trauma? Because when we have that history, when there's other things that come up later, we may be able to figure them out. For instance, we have one veteran um, who, whenever the, you know, the curtain around the bed would be pulled, would become very highly agitated. And then looking through his history, he discovered that um, he actually was a Holocaust pilot. So for him, whipping those curtains around was a trigger, it was a flashback of the helicopter blades. So if you don't know some of this history, those little things like that, you don't know. And we really want to give the best quality of care that we can. So um, I want to also point out, so yes, I'm at the end of life spectrum, but don't always assume that end of life means elderly. Because unfortunately, we have people in their 30s, in their 40s, and their 50s that are the end of life, which brings a whole other aspect to our event. Um, so we know that um, with PTSD symptoms, there's mostly three clusters. Um, you have the um, your avoidance clusters where you don't want to go or talk about or be anywhere near what might you think about the trauma. Um, and the second piece is that PTSD doesn't really belong. It is intrusive, it is a nightmare, it is your flashbacks. It's not just, oh, when I think about that thing, it bothers me. It's not going to leave you alone. And then you have the anxiety and all the emotions that go with that. Okay. So what we find is that a with combat trauma um, sort of process it in three ways. And the first way will be that they are able to process it and they're able to make peace with that. And we see this mostly with our uh, World War II veteran heiress, um, because of just the culture of that war and when they came back and anything that went back. Um, the second trajectory is um, a veteran who took the combat trauma, they developed PTSD, and they just suffered with PTSD from the get up. The third trajectory that is the one we see the most often is sort of this delayed processing. So the trauma happened, and we see this sometimes with female veterans that have sexual trauma, is yes, this trauma happened, but I have a mission to do, I don't have time to deal with that. So you just shove that trauma deep inside, and you move ahead to do mission. And it gets shoved inside for so long, and then comes maybe a terminal diagnosis. And then all of a sudden it comes back. They've never processed it, they've never deal with it, and it's completely overwhelming for that. Um, even just um, getting that terminal diagnosis could be enough to be a trigger. And so when PSB occurs, one of the things is that you have to have had a feeling of helplessness. So when we see this with our veterans, and especially our nonverbal veterans, is Having that feeling, so I, I am now, I need other people to help care for me, and I'm helpless again. 
that feelings are helpless and quicker and make them relive that trauma. Then they have this nonverbal veteran who is agitated and upset. We don't know what's going on, but in their head they're literally reliving the trauma that brought them to PTSD in the first place. Um, we're quick to throw out at people. Um, did that event have its place? Yes, this is not good for the elderly, as you guys know too. But, but what happens to seeing veterans is you give them Ativan to calm them down, and it actually has a paradoxical effect. It makes them more worked out. So if I am believing that it's my mission to keep all of you safe, and I'm trying to do that, and you give me something that's going to make me like a little drowsy, I'm not just going to go away. I'm going to fight even harder to stay awake. So now you make it this veteran, and now they are more agitated, and they are more upset. Uh, with the other medication and work that day. So in hospice, um, if we do use morphine, morphine absolutely has a place in hospice. Um, and I know there's some stigma things, but um, it, it's at end of life. Mom's not going to go with the quarter and try to get heroin or anything like that. It does have a point. However, getting veterans to take morphine is a whole other ball of wax. Um, they don't want to see weak. Now, together, in, you know, are you in pain? No. Ow. They don't want to admit it. Uh, they don't want to take it. Um, for some veterans who are really suffering and trying to make peace with things that the Navy did, and we are seeing that there's a lot of our Vietnam era vets, is they deserve the pain. They don't want it to be taken away. They shouldn't be made to suffer. And we get that they finally do take it, they're like, oh, I didn't realize. Okay. And that's what we're also seeing when they're about to start to use cannabis. If they, when they finally start to use it, seeing how that anxiety actually helps reduce the pain, where they weren't even thinking that the anxiety might even be a factor. Um, so we had one veteran who um, he started with those little chocolate edibles, um, and he enjoyed them very much. And uh, even his, um, his daughter had said, like, I have no idea how much anxiety is playing into your breathing. Um, he was happier, um, and then he's like, hey, what you guys eat around here? Oh God, Dad, you're hungry? He's like, yeah, I can rip up the mac and cheese and go for it. And it's just so much of his quality of life. Um, and that was good. That was really good. Right. So, one of the other tasks that we have um, at end of life, and again, it doesn't mean that you're elderly, is to look back and do like a life review, like you're kind of talking about. And that's one of the tasks you do, is to look back on what you've lived, have your choices, and to make peace for that. If you don't make peace with them or some sort of acceptance, it's not going to lead to a good death. And we all deserve a good death. And we definitely deserve our veterans to have that good death. However, if I've got PTSD, I've got all this anxiety, and then I've got all this avoiding, I don't want to talk through any of my trauma or any of my stuff. Cannabis allows them to decrease that anxiety and be able to walk through the trauma and process it. And also, that very messy picture. But it's up to them to do that. And um, like they said, that is, it, it's a gift. Cannabis is, can give them that gift to do that. Um, legislation wise, you guys pretty much already said everything that I want. Obviously, our folks in nursing homes don't have any access to it because federally funded places are not going to allow a federally illegal substance. Um, home patients. So I know during like the Veterans Day week and all that stuff that um, a lot of um, agencies could do free certification, which is wonderful. That's really wonderful. But a lot of our patients are too weak to go to the certification. Okay. They need someone to come to the hall to that. Some places will come to the hall, but it's for an additional fee, which brings them back to the first place. They don't have the money. Okay, they on and they come. And then we have a younger batch who didn't plan to suddenly get stage four pancreatic cancer due to the chemical they were exposed to. Maybe their um their spouse had to be a caregiver that's getting no outside income. They just don't have the extra money for this. Okay. Um the second thing they don't have is time. They don't have time. I don't have three to four weeks. I don't have three to four weeks to wait. Um, so we have one better he, he did the right thing, he, he went down, he got his card, finally got his card in the mail. Went to the dispensary, the dispensary said, well, no, you can't come in without a caregiver with a card, okay? This man, bucket list, was, he couldn't believe that a dispensary was actually a thing. <laughs> so being a 65 child, he wanted to walk into the dispensary and order some weed, according to him. He had passed away before his daughter's caregiver card ever came in. Um, 
and it's a community where they don't access cannabis and where they able to use that, but by following like the rules that the state has set up, had he not been allowed to access anything, that's, it, it's unforgivable. It's just absolutely a travesty. Mm -hmm. So for my dream legislation is I would like to see every conversation better, not better, that the very second that Dr. White, you have the terminal diagnosis, yes. you should free access. Yes. Go to the dispensary right now with your caregiver to get whatever you need. And many dispensaries are offering a discount. I've seen between 20 and 40 percent of a discount. Absolutely. Because um, yeah, they don't, they don't have the time. You know, when I think about the veteran care too, it's just like Every single day we wake up and we take for granted that we are in a free country. We are in a free country. We're not occupied, and these poor veterans that have the PTSD as a result of the trauma that they suffered, earning us that victory and the liberty that we are taking for granted. And I think it's great that a lot of institutions and dispensaries were doing um, free products and stuff like that. But as far as I'm concerned, every single day is better than today. We need to appreciate that. Um, I am going to wrap up with one story that I found told that I was going to tell. Um, so, let's see. Um, we have wonderful hospice nurses. You know, there's hospice nurses and everything, but we each are they're very tuned in to what people need and they're very tuned in to the needs of veterans. So, we had a, um, a young veteran couple, they were actually in their late 30s. And um, the spouse had a, a face cancer as a result of the chemicals that he had been exposed to. He did not have long to live. It was in um, the fall. And the family said, well, we really want him to hang on to Thanksgiving. See everybody, say our goodbyes. And this man did not have to Thanksgiving. There was no understanding of it. So our nurse said to him, what is your favorite holiday? And he goes, you know, it's actually the 4th of July. She said, okay, round up the family. You're going to have a 4th of July picnic. They had the barbecue, we had his whole family, they got fireworks and all that. So he had donated cannabis. So him and his wife were able to sit. They had a little porch overlooking. And couple by couple, his family never could come up. And he was, the anxiety was reduced, the pain was handled. That he was able to say those for guys. I just said, it, it, it's a powerful gift. It's a powerful gift. And, and I don't think that, but I really like, I know it's just amazing to do that. And Adelaide didn't do that for him. And Morphe didn't do that for him. Cannabis did that for him. Upset by that at all because I wish I could give you more time. Um, all of you more time. I think from birth to the end of life care through veterans, through addiction, we obviously clearly see how cannabis uh, can play a role. Um, I'm really grateful to hear from, from you all of some of the next steps that we should be looking at, uh, both from a science, a clinical perspective, a regulatory perspective. I think, you know, we're in an important time and um, an exciting time. Um, that we can take some of these recommendations and really try and uh, continue to improve access. So we'll go ahead and, and maybe we'll take one question. Uh, <laughs> one burning question. One quick, right? Hi. Thanks for being on tonight. Hi, my name is Kate. Um, I was just wondering how you feel it's best to address, um, I guess, from like a social media, like a young way of like approaching the next generation so that it becomes something that isn't stigmatized i just would like to see like how if there could be like a consensus about how to approach it so that the red flags don't immediately go out to everybody that you talk to about it we have um in our practice a lot of adolescents um teenagers who actually are coming and telling us that they're using cannabis to control anxiety or control mood. And initially it was a conversation, it was interesting, it became a conversation around how do we 
what do we do? They're under the age, what do we do? Um, and so what we found is that we try to educate them on it. I don't think they have the stigma that my generation had around cannabis. It's a lot more socially acceptable. Um, they actually, my experience with adolescents is that they tend to see it more from a therapeutic perspective. Just, you know, maybe that's just because I'm dealing with mental health issues, but they tend to do that. We're seeing a lot of that with our clients, but they're actually not so much abusing it. We use that as an opportunity to have a conversation about what healthy endocannabinoid system regulation looks like and what it doesn't look like. I teach a lot of mindfulness-based practices so that they can pay attention to how they're using any substance, whether it's alcohol or cannabis, but really trying to get them to understand that there, you know, that they, this can be something healthy. They just need to know, like I believe all of us need to know how to use it in the most healthy form we can. Does yeah. that make sense? It does. I do feel there is quite a stigma with my friends anyways. Mm -hmm. I'm 29, so I consider myself like very old, but at the same time I think like there is still a stigma attached to it. <laughs> 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 I did get my AARP card this month. <laughs> I think it has to do with um, controlling the narrative. There's like two different narratives about cannabis. One is that sort of tired old narrative that it's bad, it's evil. Like again, the addiction psychiatry community doesn't really recognize recreational cannabis. They think it, all cannabis use is harmful, abuse. pathological, abuse. a medical abuse, a medical uh, problem. And there's a whole other narrative that's increasingly emerging, both as people like all of us in this room work together and as patients have more positive experience and as it gets uh, legalized and more people use it, adult use, uh, you know, the sky doesn't fall. Um, actually, a lot of good things are happening in Colorado. Not only, for example, when they legalized cannabis in Colorado, not only did the opiate um, prescriptions and overdoses start to drop, but all the prescriptions started to drop. You know, people instead of getting a muscle relaxant, would use cannabis. People, instead of having to go to the doctor and get Viagra, would use cannabis. People, instead of using Ambien, which is actually pretty dangerous, would use cannabis to sleep. And the alcohol um, use dropped 10 to 20 percent, uh, generally when they legalized cannabis, which is why the three uh, biggest contributors to the these ridiculous, uh, whenever there's a marijuana or cannabis um, ballot initiative, the three biggest contributors are big pharma, the alcohol industry, and the private prison industry, because those are the three biggest losers. So um, there are, in the rehab industry as well, because they love treating cannabis addiction, whatever the heck that is. So um, there um, are two different narratives, and I think we're winning in changing the narrative, but it's like an ongoing battle with that book by Alex Berenson, and you know the American Society of Addiction Medicine is like so anti-cannabis, and they absolutely shouldn't be, and most medical societies are against cannabis still. Um, so I think it's a question of continuing to provide an alternative, which ideally will become the dominant narrative um, so that people in your generation and younger will grow up and not just hear the same old, this is your brain on drugs, mm -hmm. but will actually hear about the benefits and hear more balanced and nuanced message. Wait, wait, can I say, I have, oh, sorry. Go I was gonna say that I love to start off, and I didn't do it today, a thing called Just Say No, K-N-O-W. Because uh. I, my generation grew up with Just Say No, N-O. And for us, it's more about we're really trying to teach what it can and can't do. Yeah, I think that part of it, too, within the culture, right, as I mentioned, you have this culture that's come out of the, the recreation or therapeutic culture. But we need to stop with the, you know, uh, bipartisan cannabis ship in the sense of the CBD versus THC. You know, I mean, people don't even realize in their, their, the JAMA study that showed both their 84 online products um, 20% of them had upwards to 6.23 milligrams per milliliter of THC, okay, in it, which meant those people, somebody's taking one drop or twice a day is actually using more THC than I recommend. But yet they could be touting online that, look, without the high, I feel great. CBD is great. I'm not, you know, I'm not, and there's no this anti THCism, I think, has to kind of end. It is an intoxicant at high enough doses, just like if you take a sip of. 
wine, you don't feel anything, right? A quarter glass of wine, you can have a conversation and drive even a glass of wine. So I think THC, I think, again, I think just say no is perfect because people just simply don't know. And you have this, this kind of social media reactionaryism using CBD, but really misusing it and, and in a misleading way. So I think it's education, education, yep. education. Yep. Thank you. So we can, yeah, one last we can all have um, philosophies. And I think that our message really needs to be to Shaylee because she's going to make it. <laughs> no <not>. pressure. <laughs> no, just her. And I will give you no specifics pressure. for the nursing homes, the caregivers. You can't have just one caregiver for one patient. Those caregivers need to be able to give it to a lot of people. So, so that's got to be gone. Reciprocity. This is a medication. There has to right now. There are only nine states with reciprocity. Massachusetts needs to be the tenth. The other thing is when I gave you that pamphlet, your caution to make it safe and effective, make it a safe and effective program, has delayed implementation. There cannot be analysis paralysis. Get it out there, open it up a little bit more. Granted, make it safe, make it effective, but let it get going. Because regulation cannot be synonymous with complication. Thank you all very much. This is all understanding that Shaleen is one of our heroes. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much.